time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor and analyst, and Mr. Hardy Burt, author and correspondent. Our distinguished guest for this evening is His Excellency Kamil Abdul Rahim, Egyptian ambassador to the United States. Mr. Ambassador, our viewers are tremendously interested in the great political struggle now going on in the Middle East. And you, sir, with your long and distinguished career in the Egyptian diplomatic service, are particularly well qualified to give us some authoritative information. Now, first of all, sir, your country and Britain have just reached an important agreement over that great area called the Sudan. It's about a third the size of the United States. Now, sir, will you tell our viewers first uh, just what the significance of this agreement is over the Sudan? This agreement on the Sudan is one of the most important events and one of the, perhaps the only happy news that we have received for a long, long time in the Middle East. What does Egypt gain out of the agreement? Well, we, we gain only solving a long-standing problem. Sudanese have been given the right to self-determination, either to unite with Egypt or to be independent. In other words, in about uh, three or four years from now, the Sudanese, that, uh, that, that's almost, uh, that's a third the size of the United States, that great area will choose to be either independent or to become a part of Egypt. Is that correct, sir? Yes, in three years they will have full self-government and they will be either choose to be now, independent. Now, has, has this agreement uh, uh, ease the tensions between the West and Egypt? Uh, has it made Egypt perhaps friendlier toward Britain and the United States? I think it has eased the conditions uh, tremendously and it's only, not only that, but I think it paved the way for a final and uh, a final solution well, for the Suez problem. If the, uh, if the Sudanese uh, do decide after this three-year period to become independent, what does it mean economically and a loss to Egypt? Does it mean some economic loss? Uh, not at all. There is no economic loss at all, Does except that we only united with the, uh, with the Sudan by the River Nile, which is the life giver of both countries. Well, Does it mean any loss to the British economically? Because the British get quite a good deal of cotton from the uh, Sudan, I understand. Well, they get the cotton everywhere now, from the United States, from Peru, from everywhere, and no more now. There's a great shortage of cotton. We want to sell our cotton, but it's, we find some difficulty. What would, what would be the reaction in Egypt if, after this three-year period, the uh, Sudanese decided to join up with the British? Well, I really don't know if they're going to do that. I think this is a, a very uh, a very academic question, and uh, the British themselves, they do not feel as the Sudanese is going to join the Commonwealth. Well, but they have the right to do that if they want to. Well, if they years. are independent. Well, well, sir, now that you've gotten over this first hurdle, the Sudanese hurdle, this week you began uh, conversations with the British over that thorny problem of British troops leaving the Suez, and of course Britain has about 50,000 troops there. Now your country wants those 50,000 British troops to leave, doesn't it? Well, surely, because this, these troops have been in Egypt since 1882, and they came by force, and they still remain there in the when, Suez Canal. When do your negotiations start? Or, uh, well, we're hoping to negotiate very soon, perhaps uh, perhaps this week, do we hope think, so. Do you think that the agreement, would you make any predictions as to how it might come out, that the agreement will be that the well, British if, troops will leave the Well, if the Suez? agreement on the Suez Canal is negotiated on the, on the same spirit that we negotiated the Sudanese question, I have great hopes and I'm very optimistic of the result. Well, you want the British to leave and then does Egypt want to take over, assume the sole responsibility for the protection of the Suez area? Of course, we, we are ready to assume the sole responsibility for the Suez area. We have a, an army of 100,000. We need some equipment. 
with this equipment, we could be ready to, to defend our country. Well, and well I can assure it. you, the, 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 the country can and defend its territory better than any other foreigners. Do you plan to expand your military power in Egypt? Well, this is limited to our <coughs> possibilities of budget and so forth, but you know, we, our population is 21 million inhabitants. We could raise up to one million soldiers. Well, that brings us to perhaps the most interesting point, sir. Here in America, our policy for a long time has been to expand the military power in the Middle East. The Middle East is a power vacuum. It's an immensely rich area, 60% <coughs> of the oil reserves of the earth. And we, of course, as we as an American nation, we want to create a powerful military force in the Middle East, and we want it to be Egypt. Now, first of all, sir, you've said that your country with 21 million people, you can support an army of a million people, can't you? We can support, but you know, the, 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 the expenses of a no, new army. I mean, you, well, so you, can, you can supply <laughs> the manpower. For we such can a supply the manpower, and we could, uh, we could, through our budget, also help in uh, defraying the expenses. And Mr. Some Ambassador, of the expenses. Do you see any signs that American policy will be to equip your troops with arms if you expand your armed forces? Well, I really can't speak uh, to, uh, on the uh, American policy, but... I say, do you uh, see any signs that that might happen? Well, if, uh, if, if the United States finds it for its interest that we'll have a strong Egypt, well-equipped, as they ha found for its interest to have a strong Turkey, well-equipped in the northeastern well, Mediterranean... Egypt would like to have that kind of aid, though. Well, we are ready to have this aid, no doubt about it. Well, it's, I believe it's the announced policy of our State Department now that we want, to, we want to help create such power as you suggest. And the questions that are in our viewers' minds, I think, are these. First of all, uh, how dependable would a strong uh, Euro uh, Egypt be in the conflict between the West and Russia? Would you be a dependable ally? We have been always dependable during the last two <laughs> world wars. In the First World War, we rendered the great service to our friends, the Western powers. Of course, I suppose. In the last that. world war, we did the same thing. I don't find anything to, to the contrary for any future war. Your, your primary need is airplanes and tanks, I assume. Airplanes and tanks and anti-air defense. This is a difficult question to ask you because you can't answer it but one way that I can see, but do you think that the Egyptians are mechanically, do they have mechanical abilities to handle this technical equipment, the average Egyptian soldier? The, the British uh, Suez base is mainly run <coughs> by, Egyptian, by Egyptian mechanics. And they have a special capacity in mechanics there, and they will find the people there who could do the, this job very well, easily. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, just looking ahead a little bit, suppose you have your army of a million, and suppose they are equipped and supplied by the Americans, and maybe you get your training, some of your help in that way. Is there any chance at all of uh, these, this big armed force being used aggressively against Israel? I don't think there is any, any chance at all of that sort, because we need the army for our defense for the defense of our country. And we have no aggressive intentions whatsoever against anybody. And uh, you know that in 1950, there is a joint declaration of France, uh, Britain, and the United States guaranteeing the, the, the whole status quo there, and nobody could attack the other. Well, one of the things uh, most Americans are, are, are proud of how Turkey has developed as a military power in that area. Uh, we, we feel that we've gotten more for our money in Turkey than anywhere else, and we feel that the Turkish armored divisions are the best ones facing Russia. Now, do you think that a, an armed uh, Egypt could cooperate with Turkey in that area, or are you an ancient enemy of the Turks? Now, <coughs> no, we are not ancient enemies. We are tied and allied always with the, with the Turks, and uh, we're ready to cooperate with our <coughs> friends. We call them our cousins, the Turks, because there's a strong relations between Egypt and the Turkey for long how history. Are, how are your relations with Russia today in Egypt? Uh, are they better or worse than they were, say, a year or two ago? Well, I think the same relations with all countries. We, we well, coming back to the Turks, sir, the Turkish plan uh, where they <laughs> used a dictatorship uh, of Ataturk after the first war and then they finally evolved into a relatively free nation. 
Now, do you think you see Egypt evolving somewhat on the Turkish plan? Do you see this dictatorship now and perhaps uh, becoming a free nation in three or four years from now? As a matter of fact, we, are we have now in Egypt started on the way of, of, of a real democracy. We have a, 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 a committee now you know, discussing the principles of a modern constitution for Egypt. And we have now a provisional constitution for Egypt in which is governed. And we hope after this period of transition, we will have a, a full parliament and a, a, a modern constitution. Well, sir, now as a, as a final question, uh, Egypt has always been a land of cruel extremes, great, we great wealth uh, for a few, and then uh, uh, the perhaps the oldest and poorest peasantry in the world. And you have now begun, I believe, the first land reform in, in the Middle East. As a final question, sir, uh, will you tell our viewers how that land reform is progressing? Well, this land reform is progressing very quickly, and today, if you go to Egypt, you will find a new look in Egypt. You will find that there is a creating a new middle class of 8 million people, uh, higher wages for agricultural laborers, landless peasants are receiving lots of from 3 to 5 acres, <coughs> those who lease the land are receiving lower rents, so the result that you will have a higher standard of living for at least 8 million people in the country with uh, internal economic conditions and consumers goods and better trade and industry inside the country. Well, well thank you sir very much for being with us this evening. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was His Excellency Kamil Abdul Rahim, Egyptian Ambassador to the United States. A priceless attribute of every Longines watch is the pride of possession which it brings to its possessor. And every owner of a Longines watch knows exactly what I mean. The Longines watch brings you more than the delight of a beautiful possession, more than the unsurpassed timekeeping of a remarkable watch. You have the pleasure of knowing that you own the watch of highest prestige among the finest watches of the world. Longines is the only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Truly, when you own a Longines watch, you know that it is, in fact, the world's most honored watch. So, when next you buy a watch, either for yourself or as a gift, remember these facts. And remember, too, that if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, you're paying the price of a Longines. You should insist on getting a Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866 maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Wetnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight. Reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor watches. Wednesday nights, the big fights on the CBS television network. Time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, 
author and analyst, and Mr. Hardy Burt, author and correspondent. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Robert S. Kerr, United States Senator from Oklahoma. Senator Kerr, it's a pleasure to have you with us again, sir, on the chronoscope. Our viewers, of course, uh, know that you're one of those old-fashioned Democrats in the Indian country <laughs> uh, who get your tomahawk out every now and then. And I just wonder if there's somebody down in Washington you're gunning for now, sir. Well, Mr. Huey, I'm very much opposed to what the Secretary of Agriculture is doing to agriculture in this country. Well, now, what's, what's, your, what's your case against Mr. Benson, sir? My case against Mr. Benson is that while he is fiddling and, and talking about uh, 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 things which have no connection with reality, the producers of beef in this country are gradually being squeezed into bankruptcy. Well, now, obviously, I mean, you're not objective about this. You come from one of the great cattle-producing states, don't you? Yes, I do. And are your cattlemen uh, putting the heat on you to put the heat on Mr. Benson? Well, the, the, the cattlemen are saying this, uh, that the price of their product is below the cost of production, that if it continues, they're going to go into bankruptcy. When they do, uh, they've suffered a great loss, and the consumer population of the country uh, will find that they likewise have had inflicted upon them a tragedy. How much has uh, the price of beef been reduced from the, their level, from the level of the cattlemen themselves? I mean, well, the price, of, the price of beef on the hoof has gone down in the last 12 months 50 percent. How much has it gone down at the markets where you buy the meat? Uh, at the, in the meat market, mm -hmm. uh, it had gone down very little until the first of the year. I'd say it has since gone down uh, probably half as much as the price has been forced down to the producer. Now, Senator, you're, you're stating to our viewers as a matter of fact that the beef industry, the beef producers, are really in trouble, that they are going bankrupt if something isn't done. That's very definite. How much of a subsidy do you think they should get to keep them from going bankrupt? Uh, 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 Mr. Burt, they don't want a subsidy. Uh, they want uh, an opportunity to produce at a reasonable profit. You see, we have a program of supports in with reference to basic commodities. The Secretary of Agriculture has the authority to support perishables of many kind at 90% of parity. And the average cattleman feels that since the price of beef on the hoof has gone down now to less than 80% of parity, that the secretary should use the authority which he now has under the law and support that product at what the law uh, permits him to do. Isn't uh, that just a matter of labels, uh, Senator, not calling it a subsidy? In effect, it is a subsidy. The government's giving them money. No, no, uh, not at all. If, uh, if he would move to do that, <coughs> he wouldn't have to buy a lot of beef, uh, in my judgment. But it would still be, if you bought even a dollar's worth, it would be a dollar's worth of subsidy. Well, it would be a dollar's <coughs> worth of investment in the welfare of one great segment of our country and in well, the continuation well, uh, of a supply. Our, I know that ag agriculture represents a very great industry in this country, but so does the clothing industry and so does uh, the automobile industry. Why should agriculture have any more right to a subsidy, which the taxpayer pays, than the clothing industry or the automobile industry? Because the consumer has an equal in an abundant supply of food and fiber as does the producer. You see, the only way that the consumer can have an abundant supply of food uh, uh, at a reasonable price is for somebody to produce it. If economics are handled and force the producer back onto the law of supply and demand, all he'll do is just retreat in the matter of production, produce less food, and get more money for it. Well, I gather you don't believe in free enterprise particularly so far as the farmers are concerned. Sure, I believe in free enterprise, but I don't believe in the law of the jungle. Senator Kerr, our viewers have heard a great deal of discussion about this in, in the last few days. And now, sir, to simplify, the, Mr. Benson is buying butter, is supporting the price of butter at 90% parity, isn't he? Yes, sir. And that means that the government has butter and supports the price, and you are saying, in effect, that you'd like to see him do the same thing for beef. Yes, only there's this difference. Uh, in supporting the price of butter, which is in great overproduction, uh, he's accumulated probably two million pounds of butter. I think there's many things that this country could do with that butter that would make it a good investment, but that's another question. I think if he moved to support the price of beef, that it would result in the, in the packers 
paying an amount equal to 90% of parity, and I don't think it would raise the cost at the meat market a penny. <coughs> and you're telling our, our, our viewers that unless that is done, that, they are, that the beef producing industry is going to be hurt and hurt bad. That is correct. The and average beef producer is going to continue to produce at a loss until he's broke, and that's going to mean that the producers are going to gradually be going out of the market. In one or two years, the supply will be less, and then the consumer will be penalized by having to pay more for less beef. Senator, what did you think of uh, this two-day supply for the whole country of New Zealand beef coming over and selling at 35 cents a pound from New Zealand? recently happened, you know. Do you think that was a uh, good thing for the cattlemen or a bad thing? Were you opposed to these imports of beef? Well, yes, I'm opposed uh, to the imports of beef uh, when we have competitive, unsupported, uh, similar products. Hmm. Now, if, if the Secretary had moved to put a support program under the price of beef, then when imports imperiled the price of beef, he could have moved to curtail imports. Well, but until he moves to support the price of the domestic product under the law in which he operates, he can't move to curtail imports of a competitive product. Well, that brings us to the to the second your second major interest, I believe, in Congress, sir, uh, which you are interested <laughs> in the reciprocal trade agreements and in foreign trade. That's correct, isn't it? I am keenly interested in reciprocal mm -hmm. trade. Well, now. Does that mean that you are in favor of what our viewers have heard a lot of discussion about? You believe in trade, not aid? Uh, I believe in, in the promotion of trade to the greatest possible extent for the mutual welfare, both of the buyer and the seller, which is our country and our customers. You believe in the lowering of tariff barriers? Uh, where, uh, on a reciprocal basis, <coughs> it promotes uh, a greater trade between those that make the adjustment. And that, would, much, go, that uh, would go for uh, cattle, too, you, you would beef, too? I mean, if there were any bar barriers against beef? You were against the importation of beef uh, just now. I'm you. against the importation of beef when it, uh, when it tends mm. to add to the destruction of an unsupported domestic uh, agricultural product. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, that's correct. How much, how much are we selling abroad now, sir? Uh, uh, we're selling at this time better than $15 billion of American products per year. And how much are we buying? We're buying abroad? about $9 billion. So there's about $6 billion there that we have to make up one way or the other. Have either to make it up with gifts or loans. And you are in favor of making it up by buying an additional I'm in $6 favor of making it up by creating an environment that will result in our buying enough to offset what we sell. I think it's far better to increase our trade rather than our aid. Well, you're I a supporter did. of President Eisenhower in this because I think he believes the same thing, doesn't he? He does. Yes. yes. Well, now, do you concede, sir, that there'll be some segments <coughs> of American industry or American producers who will be hurt by our buying an additional six billion dollars worth of foreign made goods? There will be times when it will hurt some domestic industry and when the time comes that the damage to a domestic industry is greater than the overall good uh, then I would favor a readjustment. You think that the national welfare, however, uh, the, is so important and that it overrides those... those that, yes, I uh, do, because you see the economic strength and the, and the power of our allies to, to defend themselves and help us in the common cause are all tied up in the strength of their economy, which is dependent on their trade, mostly with us. I don't suppose you've ever made any studies, sir, of exactly... Uh, what tariffs on what industry should be reduced or lowered? Well, uh, I, I have, but it is such an endless compilation of figures that I'd get lost and, and we'd all be terribly confused if we went into those details in a very well, few minutes. Senator, our viewers will recall, sir, that you were one of the, uh, who were a candidate for the Democratic nomination last year. Well, it's very kind if they recall <laughs> that. I, I had uh, thought it made a such a little impression will you, that... <laughs> will you be a candidate four years from now, do you think, Senator? I have no plan at this time to be a candidate anything uh, other than re-election to the Senate from Oklahoma. Well, you, you're, of course, <laughs> a very influential member of the Democratic Policy Committee in the United States Senate. Now, Thank sir, uh, uh, Mr. Stevenson, I believe, is on a trip around the world. So I'd like to ask you this, uh, who's making policy for the Democratic Party now? Is it Stevenson or is it the, the, the policy committee in the Senate? Well, I would, uh, I would not say that it's exclusively either. Mr. Stevenson is the titular head of the Democratic Party. Do you think he should run four years from now? If he wants to. Uh, but the, the policy of the party is being made more by the membership of the National Congress today than by anybody else. Well, sir, as a, as a final question, 
Our viewers will also recall that you were very outspoken on the Korean War. And uh, what do you think of uh, Senator Taft's uh, proposal for a general investigation of the Korean War? Well, I think Senator Taft spoke before he thought. I think he's trying to be a general again. I, I think that uh, we've got a great defense department. I think that uh, I didn't support Eisenhower, but certainly he's a great general. And I think he's better shaped to determine that than Taft is. I, I've just got more confidence in the general we in the White House than I have in any of the generals we've got in the Senate. Well, Senator Kerr, I'm sure that our viewers very much appreciated these outspoken sentiments of yours, and thank you, sir, for being with us. Thank you. And the opinions, as you've heard our speakers express tonight, have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was... Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Robert S. Kerr, United States Senator from Oklahoma. Confidence, said William Pitt, is a plant of slow growth. Now, confidence in Longine watches has been growing slowly, but very solidly for almost a century. But without a doubt, the confidence of others in Longines has been stimulated by the confidence of Longines in itself. Yes, the makers of Longines watches have been ever willing to compete with the finest watches of the world. And from such competitions at world's fairs and international expositions and in observatory timing contests, Longines watches have won countless prizes, awards and medals. Now, a Longines watch brings you more than the delight of a beautiful possession, more than the unsurpassed timekeeping of a remarkable watch. You have the confidence of knowing that you own the watch of highest prestige among the finest watches of all the world. For Easter, for an anniversary, a birthday, or for any important gift occasion, throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines with Norwatch. Tuesday Night Thrills, Danger, on the CBS Television Network. Stop washing your nylon. This is the CBS Television Network. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, author and analyst, and Mr. Elliot Haynes of United Nations World. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable J. H. Van Roy, Ambassador to Washington from the Netherlands. Mr. Van Royen, you of course represent the Dutch nation, which has always been extremely friendly to the American people, 
Also, for centuries, we've been perhaps the most uh, world-minded uh, people in the world. You're great traders, and so we are very much interested in your attitudes toward what's happening in the state. Now, first of all, uh, how would your country regard the community efforts being made to oppose Russian expansionism, namely the North Atlantic Treaty Organization? Are you supporters of it? We certainly are, Mr. Huey. As a matter of fact, the NATO, North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization, is a cornerstone of our foreign policy. And do you also, are you also in favor of creating a European army? We are. We are also strong adherents of the European army. We are doing all in our power to come to a ratification of the European Defense Treaty of Singapore. That means that you, you are not afraid of uh, Germans being converted into soldiers. We would welcome German military assistance for the defense of the European country. Mr. Ambassador, the first European nation to sign this European Union agreement has been Germany, hasn't it? The first one to ratify. Ratify, uh, rather, yes. yes. Uh, do you see any possibility of your country ratifying this agreement soon? I do indeed. I think that either immediately before or immediately after the summer recess of our Parliament, the second chamber, the lower chamber of our parliament will ratify the treaty. Well, that would leave about four or five other countries to ratify, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. Do you see any possibility of their ratification, early ratification? Well, we in Holland are very hopeful of an early ratification and sincerely trust that it will come soon. Well, that's particularly interesting, I think, sir, because your country shares a common boundary with Germany. And our viewers will recall that your country perhaps suffered more uh, from German invasion than any other Western nation. And yet, are you saying that, that you welcome the economic revival of Germany and you even welcome the military revival? We are realists, uh, Mr. and I think that we welcome both the economic revival and uh, the uh, uh, military participation of Germany in the... Uh, concerted European effort. Mr. Van Royen, uh, for the last month and a half or more, the Russian government has been speaking peace, talking peace, and generally behaving peacefully. Do you think that uh, military arrangements designed to combat possible communist aggression are as important now than they were, say, four months ago? They are certainly just as important, if not for psychological reasons, even more so. We in Holland feel that the worst possible thing we could do would be to let down our guard just at this moment. And we feel that on the one hand, uh, military preparedness, on the other hand, unity among the nations of the free world is an absolute prerequisite. Do you believe that the risk of war is less today than it was six months ago, sir? I wouldn't say that, uh, you. I think it's probably about the same. It looks on account of the new Russian tactics, as though the danger was receding. But I should say there's about the same possibility of uh, a Russian blunder or a Russian miscalculation, and a uh, third world war as a consequence of such a miscalculation. You're not afraid of a similar blunder on the part of the West? You don't think we would set off a third world war by mistake? I think that possibility is much less, but I think it's human to make mistakes. But I we think have that to watch out for it, too. We now, have sir. to watch out for it, but I think it's negligible. Moving on, sir, this uh, subject of trade is something that our people are very much interested in. And since you are the world's great traders, we'd like to have your views on what you're doing about trade now. Now, the Dutch are, of course, uh, dependent on world trade, are they not? We certainly are. We always have been. As you know, we are a trader and seafaring nation. And, and what is the state of your trade? Is it greater this year than it was last year? Has, it, has the volume been increasing? Our total trade is increasing, and our exports this year, for the first time, have equaled and slightly surpassed our imports. Is that but not as far as this country is concerned. I was going to ask. You're, you still have a dollar gap. So we far. certainly have. In other words, uh, the uh, number and amount of products and articles which we import from this country are a great deal larger than those that we can export to your country what do and you want to pay for them. What do you want to buy from Americans, sir? 
We want to buy machinery and we want to buy agricultural products. In other words, the necessities of life, necessities for our economic apparatus. And so, and in order to do that, you need dollars, and and uh, and the only way you can get those dollars is to sell us something. Well, we haven't yet discovered another way except <laughs> by aid. <laughs> and what do you want to sell us in order to earn those dollars so that you can buy our wheat and our machinery? We also have farm products, dairy products, so of a different nature than those that we want to import from you. But as you know, uh, lately there have been certain restrictions clamped on to our cheese exports to this, co uh, this country. And that has not been encouraging for the build-up of a line of exports. Well, Mr. It. Van Royen, if we keep on prohibiting you from selling cheese to us and so forth, will you be forced to turn to the East Europe and Russia and the general communist area for the wheat and the machinery that you need? Will you be forced to trade with the East? I wouldn't put it uh, so strongly as that, Mr. Haynes, but I think that if the countries of Europe as a whole are prevented from trading with the United States, the temptation to trade with the countries behind the Iron Curtain in goods which are not strategic would become very great. Well, Mr. Van Roy, and a number of Americans are beginning to think that that might not be so bad, that perhaps instead of letting all these European goods in, let's let Europe trade with the East to some extent. Uh, do you think that east-west trade is necessarily a bad thing? Putting it that way, uh, no, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It depends which side benefits most. If it's the free will that is benefited by that, more than the countries behind the Iron Curtain, and if the free world therefore gets into a stronger position, it's all to the good. And you think it's possible that the free world might benefit more by such trade than communist countries would? Undoubtedly, depending on the kind of goods which we uh, trade in. Of course, uh, the very fact that you're a great trading nation, uh, the, uh, you, you are handicapped more by the Iron Curtain than any other nation would be, aren't you? The fact we that the world is divided and that there is an iron curtain handicaps the, uh, Holland, doesn't it? We certainly are, unless we can find another outlet for our goods. What do you need to buy from behind the iron curtain? Uh, among other things, uh, such uh, necessities as coal, wheat, uh, lumber, things which we need for our national economy. Well, Mr. Ambassador, do you think that in exchange for those, if you got them from those communist countries, you could sell them goods which would not help their military uh, power, which would not aid their war effort? You could give them things which wouldn't help them to fight a war? That is certainly what we've been doing all along. But uh, naturally, they are inclined to make higher demands on us all the time and inclined to demand that we ship goods which are strategic, which we have constantly refused. So if you could, you would rather trade with the United States and get the things you need than trade with uh, communist countries? Far rather, without any doubt. Our, our people, of course, rec remember the disastrous floods that your country sir, uh, has uh, suffered in the past few months. Now, uh, h how is the rate of recovery uh, on from those floods, sir? The rate has been very encouraging up to the present. We have repaired about 80% uh, of the dikes that were breached, and we have drained and reclaimed almost uh, the same proportion of the area that was inundated. And is that uh, going to affect your, <coughs> your commitment uh, to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the fact that you suffered this disaster? Fortunately, we are not. Our government has formally stated that uh, we will honor our commitments uh, to the NATO to the full. And moreover, as you may know, we had just 10 days before the flood struck the southwestern part of our country, renounced economic aid from the United States. And our government has also given it uh, to understand in Washington that we will not again ask for that economic aid during this current fiscal year. And Ryan, is the standard of living of your country covered from the floods, a decent one, so that people won't turn to communism and fear and distrust of your, of your country? Yes, the present our standard of living is quite satisfactory, although, of course, uh, there is a certain amount of uh, unemployment, though not on an increasing scale. As a final question, sir, one of the things that we're concerned with in our country now is what other people in the West think of us. 
and of course many Americans were in Holland during the Second War, and we've been friendly, and we just wonder if there is a substantial feeling of anti-Americanism in Holland today. I don't know, I think you'll find less anti-American feeling or tendency to criticize America in the Netherlands than in another other country in Western Europe. Uh, we as a people know that you are our friend. We are grateful for what the United States has done. We are grateful for your participation in the liberation of our country from the Nazi oppression, for the martial aid which we received and by which we were able to get back to our feet much faster than we'd have done by our own effort. Well, well thank you, sir, for being with us this evening. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Elliot Payne. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable J. H. Van der Roy, ambassador to Washington from the Netherlands. We're pleased that the Longines Chronoscope is one of the television programs selected by Washington for rebroadcast to our armed forces around the world. And wherever in the world the Longines Chronoscope may go, it's virtually certain that Longines watches are already there on the wrist of many members of our armed forces, on the wrist of the citizens of these foreign countries, and in the windows of their fine jewelry assembly. Such is the fame of Longines, truly the world's most honored watch. For among the world's finest watches, only Longines watches have won 10 World Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy from the great government observatory. And Longines watches are sold and serviced in the capitals and major cities of more than 100 countries throughout the world. Now, someday soon, you may wish to purchase for yourself or as an important gift just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world. Then you will choose well to choose Longines the world's most honored watch. And unbelievably, you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as 71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch. The world's most honored gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion watch to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem Agency for Longines with Norwatch. Next Monday night, see the Ford 50th anniversary show on the CBS Television Network. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Edward P. Morgan and Bill Down both from the CBS television news staff. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Val Peterson, Administrator of the Federal Civil Defense Agency. Governor Peterson, on Chronoscope, as a matter of fact, a few months ago, you yourself made a very alarming statement. You said, as uh, I remember it, that uh, Russia was capable now of mounting an atomic attack which could cripple the, all of the important industrial centers of the United States in one blow. Since then, Mr. Malenkov says that the Russians have the H-bomb. Now, it would be helpful, I think, if you could sort of uh, 
tell us what has transpired in your shop since then. Is the situation better or worse? Well, I think we're making progress in civil defense across the United States all of the time. So far as the announcement made by Mr. Malenkoff, uh, I personally have assumed, uh, as have the people in my agency, uh, that anything that we could do, the Russians eventually would be able to do. You would not dare to make any other assumption uh, in a matter that involves the safety of the United States. I used to coach football years ago as a young fellow, and I found that whenever you underestimated the fellow you were the uh, opponent you were playing, you were in trouble. And of course, that's one of the first rules in military activity, too. So I would say that nothing has changed. There is no positive evidence that the Russians have uh, an H-bomb. Uh, You'd, you would not have positive evidence until they explode an H-bomb. On the other hand, uh, there's every reason to believe that their scientists would be able to create uh, some type of a thermonuclear device as time goes on. Well, Governor Peterson, isn't it true that if they do have an H-bomb, which is, they say, 20 times more powerful than an A-bomb, that uh, our problem is much more acute? In other words, it would take 20 less airplanes, for example, to do the job you say that they are capable of doing. Well, if it were only 20 times, any, uh, any bomb of that type that they had were only 20 times uh, more destructive than an H-bomb, our problem wouldn't be quite so bad as it probably is. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, if and when the Russians have devices of that type and have enough of them to uh, mount an attack against the United States, certainly it makes our problem much more difficult. It's a matter of degree, however. Uh, that type of a bomb would only will, will destroy a, a greater area, damage a greater area, kill more people if they happen to be in the area. But uh, the A-bomb the is bad enough. Governor, is it correct to assume that one of your biggest problems is a sort of a psychological one? I mean this. It's the problem of awakening people to the danger without crying wolf. Assuming that is true, how do you do it? Well, I think the only way in the world to arouse the American people is to give the American people the facts just as closely as it's possible to do so. Now, no one would propose that you give military secrets away. Certainly, I wouldn't do that. But the people must know all that there is to be, that they can know about enemy capabilities, about enemy weapons, and the effects of those weapons. And knowing that truth, I think you can, you can uh, uh, believe that the people will take the action that's necessary to protect themselves. Well, Governor, you said that uh, between 8 and 20 million people would be killed in event of an all-out attack, atomic or nuclear attack on our country. Now, don't you believe that this, this uh, concept is hard for the people to, to grasp? And, and isn't that one of your sort yes. of things? Yeah. It well, overalls them. I mean, myself, for example, I, I have no feeling. What could I do about it? Maybe I'm one of those. You know. There are many things that the individual can do, and of course there are many things that we can do as a nation to protect, uh, to minimize the effects of an atomic attack upon the United States. Now, the fact of the matter is we are dealing with a new problem because the atomic weapon is only eight years old, and the, the idea of intercontinental bombers that can uh, fly from country to country dropping bombs has completely revolutionized military strategy. And the, the figures that are involved are stupendous. However, uh, the fact that the problem is tough does not mean that we do not have to meet it. And as far as I'm able to figure in my own mind, as I understand Americans, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be equal to the occasion uh, when, when it arises. Governor, I want to go back, if I may, to something you said just a moment ago, which was that you thought that the American people could arise to the situation uh, given the information. President Eisenhower said not so very long ago, uh, rather urgently, that he thought that the people by all means should have more information about the atomic situation. Um, and I want to interrupt myself just a little to uh, dig into my notes, if you'll permit me, and read something that I jotted down from the New York Herald Tribune, which says, this was printed a few weeks ago, it is actually impossible to plan proper shelters against atomic attack in this country because the relevant information has not been released to the Civil Defense Administration by the Atomic Energy Commission or the military. Now the question is, after that rather cumbersome buildup, has anything perceptibly been loosened up? Well, now as a matter of fact, uh, and, and with uh, due respect for that great newspaper for which I have a personal liking, 
the fact of the matter is that, the, that my agency is well briefed by the Atomic Energy Commission all of the time and by the Department of Defense. We do have the information. However, uh, we haven't done as much research as we should do. As a matter of fact, we've done very little research uh, with respect to the effects of bombing upon civilian type of structures. The research that we have done has been largely in connection with the, uh, the effects of atomic explosions upon military installations and military instruments, upon battleships and upon airplanes. And we need to do a great deal more research as that editorial or article suggests. Well, who's fallen on their face then, Governor? Because this is not a strictly military weapon. This is a weapon that strikes at the civilian population. That is a chief uh, value. Well, that, Why aren't you getting this That's simply a shift in military strategy. The attacks now are made upon civilians and upon instruments of productivity rather than upon armies. Yeah. Uh, we are getting that information. We have not done as much research as we should have done, uh, primarily because we have not had the funds. Uh, some of the information that the military has is valuable to us, and we're in the process of transcribing it. But bear in mind that that becomes a very detailed uh, uh, and intricate engineering and uh, technical uh, procedure and uh, we haven't done as much of it as we should do. However, I want to say this about shelters. It's entirely possible to build shelters that will protect people against any kind of an explosion, atomic or any other type of an explosion. If we wanted to take, if we wanted to take America into the ground, uh, we could protect ourselves against uh, uh, these attacks. However, we would do it at a cost of billions of dollars, a fantastic amount of money. And so far, there's been no disposition upon the part of the American people or upon its representatives in the American Congress to take Americans under the ground. Well, don't you feel, Governor, that since we happen to be the major targets of this new weapon, H and A bomb, that uh, we should have more information about it? And the reason some of the apathy is that we don't realize what's going on. Well, I, I think gener generally I believe that whatever is the public's business is best handled by the public and by the public directly based upon sound information. And uh, my agency has attempted to give the public all of the information it possibly could. And I know that the prevailing sentiment in Washington is to give the people all of the information that is possible, uh, short always, of course, of giving the enemy information which nobody would want to do. Governor, that brings up another point, the actual organization uh, of civil defense on the part of volunteer workers. Uh, I've had the impression in talking to some friends of mine who have uh, done some volunteer work in civil defense here in New York City and other cities that an awful lot of people, if you will pardon the expression, uh, go into it out of boredom. They're tired of, of bridge or scrabble or whatever and uh, um, they go into it just to see what can be done. Now what about this public apathy? Well, uh I think that there is a failure on the part of the public to realize the danger in which America lives. And I think there are several reasons for that. And if you'll permit me, I would, I would try to outline them very rapidly. First, most of us uh, do not like to do today what we should do in order to prepare for tomorrow. We procrastinate. We're a little bit lazy. That's true in our private lives. Uh, secondly, uh, um, anyone of intelligence and information is hoping and praying that we won't have a third world war. Because in this uh, age of the atomic weapon, uh, war would be a, a third world war would be a catastrophe for all mankind and some people in that connection and I offer this as another reason are wishing that there will not be a third world war and they're wishing so hard that they've wished it into a reality well and then in addition to that there are two other things that are quite important some people say well the destructiveness of modern atomic uh, of the of atomic bombs and of uh, these uh, thermonuclear devices that may come into play will be so great that there isn't anything you can do about it and then finally, and this is quite significant, about 60% of the American people revealed in a study which we made through the University of Michigan a year ago that they believed that the military could stop the atomic bombs from falling upon the United States. Well, I'm sorry to have to tell you that uh, the military will tell you that as of today, they cannot stop a successful Russian attack. That can be corroborated rather dramatically, and we didn't plan it this way, Governor, but the floor manager has just handed me a bulletin saying quoting Pravda as saying that the Russians have just exploded a hydrogen bomb. Now, as a final question, uh, and this, we might say a loaded one, very quickly, uh, with that information, could you tell us uh, in about three words what we should do with that in mind? I should say that we should step up our uh, civil defense program and we should, of course, step up our military defense program. Thank you very much indeed, Governor Val Peterson.
The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Edward P. Morgan and Bill Downs, both of the CBS television news staff. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Val Peterson, administrator of the Federal Civil Defense Agency. If you're contemplating the purchase of a very fine watch, it would be profitable to you to compare the facts about Longines with the facts you have about any other watch. And you'll find that the facts about Longines are convincing proof of surpassing quality. Factual evidence that in a Longines watch, you have one of the world's very finest timepieces. For in competition with the world's best watches, Longines watches alone have won for excellence and elegance, 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals. For accuracy, highest honors from the leading government observatories. For dependability, a position of leadership in sports, aviation, and in science. Yet, though Longines is one of the very finest watches made anywhere in the world, a Longines watch is not excessively expensive because you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as seventy-one fifty, And, and this is important, whatever the price, every Longines watch is manufactured to the high standards of quality which have made Longines the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift. Longines, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Edward P. Morgan and Bill Downs, both of the CBS television news staff. This evening's guest is one of the most distinguished ladies in American life, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. Mrs. Roosevelt, some nights ago, I had dinner with a man and his wife in Spokane, Washington. Quite sincerely, but quite seriously, they asked me two questions. They said, do these foreigners hate us as much as they seem to, and are they ever going to be grateful for the things that we do for them? Now, you've just come back from one of your latest trips in far parts of the world. Could you answer those questions? Well, I would not say that foreigners hated us. I would say that um, many of them were a little suspicious that uh, they did not like to feel that everything they wanted to do, they had to ask us for our help. Or some of it would come from the United Nations and they liked that better because they were members and they felt they got it by right and there was no one individual nation that they had to 
depend on. Well, but I would say that it was always hard to be grateful for something which you felt um, you would like to have be able to do without asking anyone. Well, Mrs. Roosevelt, we've heard a lot about uh, uh, criticism of American policy and what we have done or tried to do. Is this something new or, I mean, is this something to do with this administration, the Truman administration, or perhaps even your late husband's administration? Is this? No, I think it began probably um, when the war was over and we began uh, to have to help people to build up again. And we were the ones who had not been bombed and who had com uh, no homes destroyed. We had difficulty in getting new homes, but we didn't have to clear away acres of rubble of old homes that once existed. And we, we had our whole production unit intact, and practically no other nation in the world was in that fortunate position. In other words, this is history rather than this policy. Is history rather than politics. And I, I think, of course, that there is some envy in it. Um, there is, when people say, will they never be uh, grateful for what we've done, I think there is gratitude. But uh, gratitude is sometimes swamped by the sense of why was this done? Was it done in the long run so we could we who've just freed ourselves from political domination be dominated through economics. Now that's not unnatural because the history of most of these countries in Asia and in some parts of Europe is that people who do things for you expect something in return. And I suppose if we do things as we are supposed to do in enlightened self-interest that we're not necessarily expected uh, to anticipate gratitude. Well, of course, it is enlightened self-interest because getting them back on their feet is necessary for us because we need markets. You spoke of the United Nations, Mrs. Roosevelt, and that brings up uh, a, a most topical point. Uh, and before we get into the heart of it, let's explore uh, a public reaction to it here. There seems to be a great deal of, of suspicion among our own people about the United Nations and its... Uh, effectiveness. Uh, what is your reaction well, to that? I think that's easily explained because you see we're a very big country and a very strong country. We have not needed any of the programs carried on by the specialized agencies which are the action part of the United Nations. We've not needed those programs in our country because we were all right. Um, India has needed to have land cleared of malaria. Mm -hmm. Other nations have needed help to get rid of tuberculosis. Um, there are a thousand and one things that less fortunate nations uh, can see have happened and be grateful for uh, from the United Nations. We don't happen to have been in that category. It matters to us what the United Nations does elsewhere because again, where people are ridden with malaria, they will never buy our goods. Well, Mrs. Roosevelt, do you think that the United Nations, as an instrument of, of uh, world political opinion and operation, has lost ground in the last, say, five, six years in this country? I think, like everything else, that we started out expecting that the United Nations would solve every difficulty right just by being the United Nations. We didn't realize that the United Nations was only all the nations gathered in one place, but all the troubles remained just as they were before. And therefore, we had to work to make the United Nations work. And we didn't want to work. And we didn't expect to have to do this work. And now we know we have to, which is healthy, I think. That brings up another point, Mrs. Roosevelt. Uh, Secretary of State Dulles, has just made an important speech before the American Bar Association in Boston. The essence of which was that the United Nations Charter, I think he put it, uh, was a pre-atomic age charter and therefore not flexible to the times. And he recommended that the Security Council be stripped 
of the veto and uh, said that in some future assembly in 55, I believe it was, that the United States would consider sponsoring such a move. What do you believe about that? Well, of course, that's a great change for the United States because uh, we felt that unless um, we had the veto, we would never get the charter through Congress. And um, that was one reason why the veto was put there. Of course, the fact that the Soviets have misused the veto, used it for a great many things that it was not intended for. What it was intended for was to make it possible for a, a nation, a great nation, to prevent the discussion of domestic affairs, which they considered were no business of anybody else's in the world. Mm -hmm. um, whether we now are ready to submit to discussion of our domestic affairs is a question that the people will have to decide. Aren't we in effect, or isn't Secretary Dulles in effect, asking for a showdown, though, when he says, all right, leave us split the uh, United Nations or let people line up on our side or their side with no veto and we carry this by majority vote. Is, do you think that is a possible consequence? Well, um, I would hope uh, that perhaps, just as we trust our people in the United States, we were trying the experiment of trusting the nations of the world. Um, I hope we would do nothing, however, so definite that we really hurt the United Nations uh, because I think this is the one great hope for eventually building peace. And to do anything, like making a pronouncement um, of a policy, a, which you cannot change if you find it is unwise in the future. And today, heaven knows, you're being met constantly with new reasons, and you ought to be able to be flexible. Mrs. Um, Roosevelt, excuse me, speaking uh, as Bill Downs did a moment ago of lining up on one side or the other, uh, what is your view as to our position regarding India and the issue of uh, her representation at the Korean Peace Conference? Well, last year I was in India and I wrote a book called India and the Awakening East as just trying to explain some of the problems of that area of the world in very simple fashion because I could only give impressions. It's not a learned treatise. Uh, my feeling is that when you insist on lining up people, what you do is put our friends uh, with the Soviets if you insist that that's the only place they can sit. Uh, I feel it's very unfortunate. Well, Mrs. Roosevelt, this is, uh, you have been become known as the leader of what is loosely called the liberal movement in this country, or what used to be called the liberal movement in this country, and some people call them do-gooders and the rest of it. Could you define a liberal for us? I mean, uh, you yes, in your own words. It's very hard to put in a few words what a liberal is, but I would feel that a liberal was a person who kept an open mind, was willing to meet new questions with new solutions, and felt that you could move forward, you didn't have to always look backwards and be afraid of moving forward. And you that's what this National Issues Committee uh, that you... National Issues of. Committee is going to try to look at the issues, to put them in simple terms so that the people can understand them as objectively as possible and to feel that they can, as the liberals do, move forward. In Quickly, a final question, Mrs. Roosevelt. I'm sorry, Bill. Um, we've been told by our experts that we may have to live in this world of uncertainty and indecision, short of war, uh, in a cold war, for X number of years to come. What is your recipe for us to face up to it? Well, I think the study of our history. Certainly, the people who settled this country didn't have any great uh, security. And uh, it's hard for the young to live in uncertainty. They love to be sure of the future. But I really think that we have the stamina, <coughs> particularly if we look at what we came from. Thank you very uh, to much. Live through uncertainty. Thank you very much. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Edward P. Morgan and Bill Downs, both of the CBS television news staff. Our distinguished guest for this evening was Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt.
There are many, many watches which sell at prices equal to or higher than Longines. So if you wish to be sure of getting a watch of truly fine character, what should you do? Well, just compare the facts you have about any other watch with the facts you have about Longines. And the facts about Longines prove it to be one of the finest of all the world's watches. For in competition with the world's best watches, Longines watches alone have won for excellence and elegance 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals. For accuracy, highest honors from the leading government observatories. For dependability, a position of leadership in sports, aviation, and in science. Yet, though Longines is one of the very finest watches made anywhere in the world, a Longines watch is not excessively expensive because you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as 7150. And this is important. Whatever the price, every Longines watch is manufactured to the high standards of quality which have made Longines the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift. Longines, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Thursday nights, enjoy the Lux Video Theater on the CBS television network.